WKRG News 5 is honoring black history. Knowing he can go over there and liberate somebody else's freedom, but when you get back over here, you still have to get on the back of the bus. People that were resentful simply because of the fact that they just was not ready for a black man to break that record. And would I rather be up there flying those airplanes or down here in this hot sun working in the field? Honoring Black History, sponsored by the Mobile County Sheriff's Office and the History Museum of Mobile. Hi everyone and welcome to our Honoring Black History Special. I'm Peter Albrecht. And I'm Devin Walsh. We're glad you're with us. Today we are uncovering and diving in to learn about the unique history that surrounds us here on the Gulf Coast. We are here in Africatown, about three miles north of downtown Mobile. And this is an area that was settled by 32 West Africans who in 1860 were among the last illegal shipment of slaves to the U.S. Well, fast forward 200 years later, the ship that those slaves were on, the Clotilda, was discovered in the Mobile River Delta. Yes. It is Clotilda. So the Clotilda came up this way? Straight up here, practically in a straight line after they dropped off the people. They found history. These were strong people, strong will people. And that's what came to America. It's the, the bow right there. That's it right there? Right yes. The bow, yep. Oh, you can see it like that? Yes. Wow, you can see it totally clearly. I mean, that's the ship. Here now, we have the whole story. And the ship tells the story. Right here at St. Louis Point is where the 32 West Africans left the Clotilda and founded what we now know as Africa Town. And since the discovery of the ship's remains, the heritage of those on board has really come alive. Gabby Easterwood spoke with the ship's descendants and brings us their stories. 160 years of mystery. That's the story of the Clotilda and those direct descendants of the men and women captured. Theodore Kibi, a descendant of Osiah, and Annie Kibi, two of those 110. When they landed here, about right here, uh, oh man, it, it, was, it was pretty bad for them. They dropped them off here when it, when it was cold, naked. Rose Turnstall joining Kibi in his mindset while being on the land where their ancestors once stood. Rose carrying the same name as her ancestor, Rose Allen. It's really kind of a spiritual place being here. Um, it connects me more to the actual journey and to the people on the ship. Those once slaves bringing their heritage to life and creating Africa Town. Lottie Dennison, Bobby Dennison's great grandmother, becoming a productive citizen of Mobile. It's things like that that let me, lets me know that, you know, my family came here because apparently they were meant to be here. And even though it wasn't by choice. To be some of the few African Americans in this country to actually be able to say this is where I'm from. Um, that's that's a great feeling. Now with the discovery of the Clotilda and the partnership with Visit Mobile for Tourism, they can push forward their purpose of education. I just want to do as much as I can to keep our history going. The strength of those 110 running in their veins, a story far from finished. Really strong people to be here and not only surviving but thriving. In Africa Town, I'm Gabby Easterwood, WKRG News 5. There are a lot of movies being filmed here in Lower Alabama known as Bama Wood, but there's one film being produced in Georgia that's all about this spot here in Africa Town. The Savannah College of Art and Design, or SCAD, gave our Megan Mackey a sneak peek at its new documentary about the Clotilda and the history that's lived on for generations. It's an honor for us to, to be part of this project, to find out about the even greater history of Africa Town. When the city of Mobile announced plans for a documentary film and water tour about the Clotilda, the last slave ship to bring Africans to the United States, a contract was approved by the city council to partner with SCAD, Georgia's Savannah College of Art and Design. The school responsible for making a documentary about the Clotilda and a water tour to fuel tourism and educate people on the history of the ship and Africa Town as a whole. We we think this is uh, one of the leading tourism stories in North America. This is again a story that I think is a million tourists a year once the assets are fully developed. The city paying SCAD $190,000 for the project. 
which includes faculty and students from SCAD Pro, a department within the design school that takes on professional challenges. There's a diverse group involved. In fact, one of the students is from Ghana and applied to work on the project, having a close connection to the story. For me, this is not really, it is not a project in isolation, but it's a tool to ensure that Africa as a whole not only remembers its history, because our history is not merely, it's not only slavery. And I think that that's an important aspect to, to highlight, that whenever we highlight the past, whenever we look back, we should ensure that people have a platform to look forward. SCAD tells us they're currently in the research phase of the project, equipping themselves with history and knowledge before starting on the design phase for the documentary and immersive water tour. Visit Mobile excited to see it come to life. When we deliver this story and turn it into experience and these assets develop, people are going to want to come work, live and play there uh, again. Visit Mobile says they anticipate the project being complete by summer. Reporting in Africa Town, I'm Megan Mackey for WKRG News 5. War heroes forgotten and dishonored. African American service men from famous forces like the Tuskegee Airmen buried beneath blight and debris. Well, now members of the community have come together to return honor and respect to those buried in Oak Lawn Cemetery. Here's WKRG News 5's Amber Grigley. Standing right behind me is men from the 92nd, the 93rd, from the Tuskegee Airmen, from the Red Ball Express from the 370 Artillery Group. You can just about imagine the unnerving feeling for Eddie Irby Jr. Here's a couple of guys here. To see this section of land that is supposed to be honored and well respected in such deplorable condition. These were guys, we're not talking about old men, we're talking about guys that were from 14 to 19 years old who took the call. A call that millions of African-American soldiers were either drafted to do or left no other choice but to serve, while being treated like second-class citizens by their own country because of the color of their skin. It gives me chills because when you could think of a kid, 14, 15, 60 years old, black, wanting to go and fight a world war, knowing he could go over there and liberate somebody else's freedom, but when you get back over here, you still have to get on the back of the bus. And through it all, many returned back to Mobile wanting to do more for their community, to only be forgotten in their resting place. When I first walked into this cemetery, I walked in up there where the flagpoles are, but I could not get no farther than that tree because everything from there back to where here was the weeds were above my head. Irby says all he could do was pray and ask God to send him just a few people to help clean up Oak Lawn Cemetery. Those prayers answered in more ways than he could ever imagine. Well, he didn't send me a couple of people. He sent me a whole regiment because I could not get any help from anybody until the veterans step up. Veterans near and far stepped up to the plate to turn this cemetery around. Beautifying this cemetery allowed Irby to find a piece of history of his own. For 40 years, he had been searching for his father's grave to only find out that his father is buried less than a half a mile away and yet another unkept gravesite. It was bad, and you know, some of the time, and I, sometimes I really get upset when I used to go to these some of these funeral homes. Irby says these cemeteries should hold the same value as other historical sites around the city, and that it's important to share this story so that our youth don't allow history to be ignored again. If um, you don't know where you came from, how, you, how can you know where you're going? With photojournalist Arnell Hamilton, I'm Amber Grigley. Driven is a new series highlighting the positive things in the community, stories that are often overlooked. For Black History Month, WKRG News 5's Amanda DeVoe takes you to a black-owned grocery store in Pensacola where they are filling a need in an underserved part of the city. I'm so glad you came, and you got a plan. Making a trip to the grocery store in Pensacola's majority black 5th district is not easy. Because the only places that are close enough for um, fresh, nutritious, nutritious food are like the public. For Marnie Woodson, it was a problem she thought about for months. They can't walk to the public. It's also in the gentrified part of town and it's not as affordable. So she came up with the idea to open Busy Bee Mercantile and General Store, where shoppers can get their pick of fruits, veggies, and grains, and can also grab a bite to eat. 
The goal of this store is to make sure that people have access to fresh, healthy food in an area that's considered a food desert. Woodson says it's not just about having a grocery store here, but making sure the food on the shelves helps heal people from the inside out. Food can be used as medicine, and that in the minority communities, we suffer the most from high blood pressure, diabetes, cholesterol. A hairdresser who started to see the benefits of a healthy lifestyle firsthand, Woodson leaped on the opportunity to open up Busy Bee right next door to her tea house on 9th Avenue called Asher and Bee. The new store is a place Tia Robbins plans to visit regularly. Like it just means so much to me and for our community and to show how we can together support each other and to have all these farmers and different people to like supply to Marnie, you know, and mostly black farmers. It's just, it's an incredible experience and it's incredible for the community. The black owned business is not only supporting the health of people in the community, but their pockets as well. Woodson's store brings in several jobs for locals. People don't make a lot of money nowadays as far as, you know, working goes. So, and when the pandemic, it's like, what do you do? So this is a good time. This is something to celebrate. We need something to celebrate right now. Preserving and uplifting black lives in an area often overlooked. Awesome, enjoy, thank you so much, appreciate it. In Pensacola with photojournalist Dan Kettinger, I'm Amanda DeVoe, WKRG News 5. I got millions and millions of pieces of mail from people that were resentful simply because of the fact that who I was and they just was not ready for a black man to break that record. From hate mail to the Hall of Fame, we're remembering Mobile native and longtime legend Hammerin' Hank Aaron. He earned his wings of gold at Pensacola NAS. A Lieutenant Commander Donnie Cochran. Tonight, we're saluting this trailblazer as part of Black History Month. But you must never, ever give up or give in. You must keep the faith and keep your eyes on the prize. That is your calling, that is your mission, that is your moral obligation, that is your mandate. Get out there and do it. We're here at Mobile County Training School in the heart of Africa Town, where so much of our African American history is alive on these walls, including our great baseball heritage. All of our Hall of Famers and legends like Cleon Jones, a native of Africa Town who still lives here in Plateau, and of course, the great Hank Aaron, who passed away just last month, the all time home run king who will never be forgotten here in Mobile or across the country. Randy Patrick takes a look at his life and legacy. As we celebrate Black History Month, we continue to remember the life and accomplishments of Hank Aaron, who passed away on January 22nd at the age of 86. Henry Louis Aaron was born in Mobile in the month of February, and on February 5th, 1934, Herbert and Estella Aaron couldn't have possibly dreamed that 40 years later they would be greeting their son at home plate in Atlanta after he broke the great Babe Ruth's home run record. The chase brought out the good, bad, and ugly in baseball fans. The ugly, Hank receiving racist mail and death threats. I got millions and millions of pieces of mail from people that were resentful simply because of the fact that who I was and they just was not ready for a black man to break that record. Longtime friend Tom Withers remembers being with Hank in the final days of the chase to watch his best friends back. I stayed with him for about 10 days. And we would go back and forth for to the store or whatever. Wherever he wanted to go, I was with him. Number 44 became more than a great ball player. His strength and courage to overcome hatred became an example for others to follow. A young promising ball player from Mobile honored in death by two former United States presidents and a civil rights icon speaking at his funeral. He will always be with us as Martin Luther King is with us. Hank's name and memory will live on in his hometown. The Hank Aaron Loop was the city's first swing at honoring baseball's home run king. In 1997, the city hit another home run when the Bay Bears named their new stadium, Hank Aaron Stadium. The opening night, uh, 1997, he did say this was the greatest moment in his life. In 2010, Hank's childhood home made national headlines when it was moved from Tolmanville and placed on the stadium grounds as a museum. Hank invited a few of his famous friends to come to Mobile to celebrate. 
Mayor Sandy Stimson has announced plans to honor Hank and Mobile's four other Major League Baseball Hall of Famers with statues near Cooper Riverside Park. Hank Aaron is gone, but will never be forgotten. We all know that Pensacola is home to the Blue Angels, but this year marks 75 years of the Blues. But not everyone knows the story of one history-making pilot more than three decades ago. Our Cody Long has more on the obstacles that pilot faced and how he overcame them. In 1986, history was made with the first African-American pilot for the Blue Angels. A Lieutenant Commander Donnie Cochran. 35 years later, Donnie Cochran reflects on one of the greatest times of his life. The Blue Angel Diamond is rolling. The dream started as a kid on his family's southwest Georgia farm, watching planes fly overhead. That inspired me. I was thinking to myself, you know, would I rather be up there flying those airplanes or down here in this hot sun working in the field? He flew for three seasons in the late 80s. He came back in 1994 as the commander and flight leader. To fly for three years and then to come back as flight leader was uh, was like lightning striking twice in the same location. That very rarely happened. He later resigned, citing personal training difficulties. He feared his flying performance was not adequate and could be a safety risk to the team and to the public. He says it was a lot of pressure being the first African American. The intensity level was probably much greater as a person of color than, uh, than let's say, uh, if you are part of the majority. Other pilots reportedly grumbled about his skills and said he got the job only because he was black. But the Navy denied that assertion. Cochran didn't go into detail. He talked about leadership and an important lesson he learned. You cannot lead or you should not follow anyone who will dishonor you. But he says he loved his time with the Blues despite any challenges. If you hold grudges, it's like drinking poison and hoping the other person die. He now spends his time as a motivational speaker and splits much of his time between his home in Central Florida and being back on the farm where he first realized the sky's the limit. Cody Long, WKRG News 5. WKRG continues to honor Black History Month. Gordon Parks is an internationally renowned photographer, um, and he was also a fashion photographer, and he directed Shaft. A local art display capturing the time of segregation for Black families in Mobile. See the photos that tell a story. While I did not seek this job, I consider it an honor. And if confirmed, I will carry out the mission of the Department of Defense, always with the goal to deter war and ensure our nation's security. There is a special exhibit at the Mobile Museum of Art that takes people back to the civil rights era through photographs, but not just any photographs. Bill Riles explains. From now until the end of the year here at the Mobile Museum of Art, you can see an exhibit by writer, director, and world-class photographer Gordon Parks. It's called Segregation Story in Mobile, 1956. Um, Gordon Parks is an internationally renowned photographer. Um, he is originally from Fort Scott, Kansas, and he worked, um, when he was creating these photographs, he worked for Life magazine. Um, and he worked there for several years and he was also a fashion photographer and he directed Shaft. Parks was the originator of so-called black exploitation films like Shaft, but these photos are the real deal of life in and around Mobile during the civil rights era. They document the day-to-day -day living of the Thornton family during segregation. An iconic sign captured in one of his images taken at the Mobile Sanger Theater is also on display. I think as an art museum, um, we are always trying to bring art and artists that are not only great, but uh, exploring themes that are relevant to this community. And I think uh, this Gordon Parks exhibition just kind of checks all those boxes. All of the 20 photos were originally published as a photo essay by Parks in Life magazine in 1956. They will remain on display until the end of the year.
In Mobile, Bill Riles, WKRG News 5. As well as that exhibit, the city of Mobile has held a number of events over the last couple of weeks to honor Black History Month. Well, let's take a look at some of those events, including a virtual African dance performance. What is the connection of African dance history? to the next generation. Our mission is to never let anybody forget what they went through. The Serengeti's where I'm from. I'm a hunter feeding my family. I'm a man on my own, on my own, on my own. Thank you so much for watching our Honoring Black History special. Go to WKRG.com for more stories like you saw today. From Africatown, I'm Devin Walsh. And I'm Peter Albrecht. Good night. Honoring Black History, sponsored by the Mobile County Sheriff's Office and the History Museum of Mobile.